Okay, so um, we're gonna bring this meeting to order and I'll start the meeting with the chairman's general announcement. And the Board of Health is re um, recording. Is anybody else recording? All right, um, so we'll begin the, uh, the meeting. And um, first thing on the agenda, I believe um, is Mary, um, just to say a couple things. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I thought I was muted, but I guess I'm not. Um, Chris, do you have the language about the um, remote meeting uh, under the government's emergency order? I have it. Okay, thanks, Alex. Yep. Somebody should read that before we get started. Can I read? Is that okay if I read? Yeah, sure. Okay, so tonight's meeting is being held virtually pursuant um, or virtually through a Zoom webinar pursuant to Governor Baker's um, March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions on the open meeting law. Thank you. Uh, so Chairman Johnston, thank you very much for letting me invade your meeting. Although I guess Alex is the one that said it was okay. I really just wanted to take a moment uh, to thank each of the three of you, uh, in particular you, Chris, for uh, hanging in there on the Board of Health. Uh, we've had some, some upset in town, as you know, and some controversy over different issues pertaining to COVID. So I, as the town manager, just wanted to express my appreciation for you in particular, um, which is not to diminish the contributions that Dr. McAdoo or Karen Robitaille made in the past, but um, I wanted to particularly thank you. And in addition to that, I wanted to welcome uh, Rebecca Torsha and Dr. Jobbins and thank each of them uh, particularly for uh, their willingness to apply for these positions and to sit on this board and, and take on the role that is vital to our community uh, and make your best effort with all the decisions that you have to make. So I just want to express the appreciation that I feel personally, and I'm speaking on behalf of the community um, and, and thanking you in advance for the for the role that you're going to play here. So that's all the time I wanted to take. I just want to praise you while I have the opportunity. And um, so carry on. And thanks. You're in Alex's capable hands now for the administration of the meeting. Uh, and good luck to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And I just want to personally say thank you to you as well um, for being such a strong supporter of um, the health department and the board of health um, throughout all of this, um, we really appreciate everything that you have done um, for us as well. So thank you very, very much. Know that we, you have our support. <laughs> Great. Um, that was my pleasure. So. Okay. So I, be I believe our first order of business is to approve the minutes from the last meeting, which was August 26th. Um, and since I was the only one there right from this group, Alex, I have to make yeah. the motion. Um, yeah. and, and then so I was technically on the webinar that day. So I can motion, I guess then, right. Does that count? I think I can, I motion to approve the minutes. If you, but were you, had you been appointed and sworn no, as a member? No, so, yeah. so then I guess Chris, Chris, you have to do it then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna make the motion to approve the minutes as written from the August 26th meeting. And then we don't do a second out of necessity. Um, and then Rebecca and um, Katie, you both have to abstain. So you just have to state that you abstain from voting. I abstain. Okay. I abstain as well. Thank you. Okay, and then next is public comment. So, okay. So I have uh, Attorney McCarthy in, on his way in. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Did you? I got signed out. Did you call on me? Yep. Yeah. You, since you signed up, you're gonna go first. There's one other person raising their hand, but you're gonna. Okay. Since you signed up, you're gonna go first. All right, thank you. Do you have your video, Justin? There we go. Thanks. Okay. Hello, so my I name can, is- set, Just let me set a timer really quick for three minutes. Hold on. Okay. 
Go ahead. My name is Justin McCarthy. I live at 84 Porter Road, and I'm here tonight to speak in favor of ending uh, the mask mandate. Last month, I filed a petition with the town council, uh, according to the, the town charter, in order to, to force a vote on ending the mask mandate. So I sent the, uh, I sent the petition to Ms. Johnston. Um, I needed 100 signatures to, to have the petition heard. I got 222 signatures. And in addition to that, I got two dozen businesses here in town to sign a letter stating that they are in favor of ending uh, the mask mandate. And in the letter, they state that as a result of the mandate, uh, they've lost income and customers, that it's been a burden to enforce uh, on their staff and on their patrons, and that they resent the fact uh, that they can still be fined over this. So I think the petition in the letter shows that there's a large portion of the community that wants the mask mandate to end. So I request that you end the mandate. And I also ask that you realize that there is this large portion of the community that for the most part is done with, with all of this uh, mandates, restrictions, and so forth. So I know you guys need to continue talking about case numbers vaccine percentages, whether we're in a yellow zone or red zone, whatever, but any further restrictions uh, are gonna be pushed back against by what is a, a pretty large portion of the community and is pretty well organized at this point. So with that, that's all I have to say. Thank you for uh, volunteering and for serving on the board. Thank you. Uh, Alex Kogan. Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Today is November 2nd, 2021, approximately 20 months into 15 days to slow the spread. Unlike 20 months ago, we have now been living with COVID-19 for almost two years. We know what COVID is, we know who it affects and how, we know how it is spread, and we know what preventative measures work for COVID and which don't. We now have treatments for COVID. Some are agreed on and others remain controversial. Not only have we learned a great deal about COVID, but we now also have not one, not two, but three vaccines available for COVID-19. Any person who has wanted to take the vaccine to protect themselves from COVID has had more than ample opportunity to do so. Those people who took the vaccine did so to protect themselves from COVID-19, something the makers of the vaccines, the CDC, NIH, Massachusetts DPH, doctors, and other medical professionals say the vaccines do. People took the vaccines to get back to normal, wearing face masks, wearing face masks in grocery stores, restaurants, and banks is, however, not normal. It is the absolute opposite of normal. Some try to make an argument that face masks are to protect the unvaccinated. America is a country based on liberty for all of its citizens. People who choose to not take the vaccine have done so for their own reasons, out of their own volition, understanding the risks of COVID and the vaccine. These people are not looking to be protected by mandates coming out of governments at any level. These people, like most Americans, wanna live their life without government interference, and they, want, and they take whatever precautions they deem necessary to protect themselves from COVID. More importantly, the face mask mandates can't possibly work to protect people from transmission. Just like Dr. Fauci couldn't specify which masks actually may be effectively blocking COVID molecules, the face mask mandate has no reference to mask types either. Considering that there is not a single serious study anywhere in the world which has shown any face masks with efficacy less than that of an N95 mask to protect from COVID, forcing people to wear bandanas around their nose and mouth is not intended for the betterment of public health. To the contrary, studies found people falsely thinking face masks of any type restrict transmission. 
feel they can go into public places while being ill and the mask will keep those around them safe. Study after study has concluded face masks do not show any statistically significant reduction in transmission of COVID-19, while also finding face masks contributing to illness due to repeat usage of single-use masks, constant touching of masks and face, relocating bacteria from hands to masks to face. And of course, as I just mentioned, people feeling they're not transmitting viruses to others while ill if wearing masks. The mandates were never okay, but they were accepted when, they, when we did not know anything about COVID and its dangers. People accepted the mandates out of fear. Now that we're educated, let's not keep the fear going via these mandates and constant reminders of COVID via the face masks. It is time. Left, so if you don't mind, uh, just... I, I am like one sentence left. Okay, perfect. It's time. The mandates must go. You are a new board. Show the citizens of this town you will do the right thing for the town. Show us you will follow the science like they did in Springfield and Longmeadow. I am urging this board to take action. Remove this frantic mandate today. It is time to unmask East Longmeadow. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bazin is on his way. Dr. Bazin, you're muted. There we go. Does that work? Yep, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Bill Bays, and I've been a practicing chiropractor in East Long Meadow since 1985. I spent my life researching and studying health. I have done this by looking at peer reviewed literature from around the world, not just reading Facebook or watching what mainstream media wants us to see. That being said, I want to say, first of all, that I don't think masks should be a political thing. We all need to use available research and common sense. And based on my research, I had just a few points that I'd like to make. Number one, uh, like the gentleman just said before me, masks really do not work. They are a false sense of security that people uh, put on their face thinking it's going to be protecting them or protecting others. Uh, article from the Journal of Pediatrics and Child Health, it says uh, the title is Do Face Masks Protect Against COVID-19? Uh, the summary was there is no good evidence that face masks protect the public against infection including COVID-19. Another article, The Annals of Internal Medicine, December 2020, uh, summary. There is uh, evidence for mask or for, for mask use versus non-use and comparing mask types in healthcare settings remain insufficient. Uh, I don't know if you can see this piece of paper. So what it's showing over here is, is a human hair. Way down here is the coronavirus. A, a human hair is 500 times bigger than the coronavirus. So this one right here shows a piece of beach sand. So trying to protect uh, someone from COVID-19 by wearing a mask is like taking a handful of beach sand and throwing it at chain link fence. It simply doesn't work. The other issue is, are they dangerous? Well, nanofibers, I don't know if you can read that. I can provide these if you need them. University of Edinburgh, Nanofiber health risk quantified. Uh, nanofibers may lead to cancer known as mesothelioma, which is known to cause breathing and asbestos issues. This is something that could happen years from now. We don't really know, but wearing those, those face masks that are probably from China, who knows what's on them. Uh, and this to me is the most disturbing part right here. There's an article from the University of the uh, Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. Uh, the the Title is, is a mask that covers the mouth and nose free from undesirable side effects in everyday use and free from potential hazards. Uh, to summarize, basically what they did is they, they measured, they, they measured um, breathing. They, they statistically significant measurable increase in pulse rate and a decrease in oxygen saturation. My question is, do you want a guy like this driving your children's bus wearing a mask when there could be an issue with breathing? And finally, dangerous pathogens found on children's face masks. This was a small study, but very important. Gainesville, Florida, University of Florida, 11 dangerous pathogens found on masks 
including tuberculosis, streptococcal pneumonia, meningitis, E. coli. I could go on and on, but obviously my time is up. To summarize, masks are not the answer, and please stop this mandate. Thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me? Sorry about that. Yep. Uh, hi, I'm Lynn Vanderleeden. I live at 34 Thompson Street. And I just wanted to say that in regards to what Attorney McCarthy said, Alex Kogan and Dr. Bill Bazin, I'm in complete agreement with all three. And I have nothing else to add. Thank you. There, there we go. Hi, my name is Rebecca Cobos. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm at Seven Jennifer Lane, and um, I would also like to say that I um, <clears throat> am in support of what um, Attorney McCarthy has has presented to this board as a parent. Um, as someone who you know lives in this community and as a parent who's, who has at least one child in the school system, um, I wholeheartedly support um, what he's asking this board to do. Uh, and thank you for your time. Okay, I do not see any more hands. Okay. All right, so the first thing on our agenda is board reorganization. So um, basically we have to appoint a chair, a vice chair and a secretary. So, Christine, if you wanna go ahead. Sure, I mean, I'm willing to be the chair given that I've been around for a few meetings, um, but I also wanted to offer to, to Rebecca, to Katie, um, if either of you are gonna jump, wanna jump on that, uh, you are more than welcome to, but I'm happy to do so if you if you want me to. Chris, I, um, I love that idea. I think that would be great. <laughs> I second that, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to be the vice chair. If that and would I'm be happy to be the secretary. Okay, so Alex, do we have to do a, a vote on that? Yep, so someone has to make a motion to appoint Christine to be the chair. I make a motion to appoint Christine as the chair. And then Rebecca, you second don't that. I second that. Yep. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. And then um, if somebody wants to make a motion to appoint Kate to be the chair. Or I'll motion to, um, to appoint Katie to be the vice chair. And I second that motion. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Do I vote? Yeah, you can vote. <laughs> I'm good. Great, and then a uh, motion to make Rebecca the uh, secretary. I second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, great. All right, so then um, the next thing on our agenda is a uh, COVID update. So we'll start by going over the cases. So I provided you guys with um, two different spreadsheets for that. One is more of a summary from February to um, when the last time the cases were updated with DPH, which is every Thursday. So October 28th uh, with a little bit of a timeline. And then the other one is you know, the more extensive you know, case numbers with the uh, percent positivities, the, you know, with the, all the other numbers. Um, and then as, as you guys all know, um, the DESE extended their mask mandate through January 15th of 2022, uh, which is mostly to allow more, more kids, the five to 11 year olds to be able to get vaccinated before they go on to allow the, the 80% um, in schools that are 80% vaccinated to remove their masks. So um, the CDC met today to, to, you know, to recommend 
Pfizer for five to 11 year olds because the FDA did that yesterday, I believe it was, or two days ago. Yep, and the CDC voted to approve it. Yep, so. Um, Just waiting on sign off, right? From yeah, UNC. so, yep. Which will happen. Yeah, she already said that in the meeting tonight. I watched the meeting, it was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I watched the, the advisory panel one last week. So it is, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so one of the things that when I was looking through Maven today and I was, I pulled together some, some additional data. So when I, I was looking at our numbers for our overall numbers for August, September, and October, and in August overall, we had 113 cases. In September, we had 115 cases, and in October, we had 83 cases. And then I looked a little bit more in depth on those cases in October, because I really wanted to know what, what populations we were seeing um, testing positive. So 31% of those cases were among um, children zero to 11 years old. And then our next two highest groups um, at 17% were 26 to 37 years old. And then at 18.5% was 38 to 49% or 49 year olds. So what you're seeing, what we're seeing right now is, is cases among that zero to 11 group, which is obviously completely unvaccinated and will be able to be vaccinated pretty soon for the five to 11 year olds. Um, and then obviously the parents group. So right now we're seeing a lot of family clusters um, still 5% um, of the cases were 12 to 25 years old. And then 50 to 61 was 8.6% of all the cases. 62 to 73 year olds were 13.5% of cases and 74 and older were 6% of cases. So the bulk of our cases are, are the zero to 11 year old group. And if you look at those who are adults, it's in our lowest vaccination rate for the city as well too. Yep. Yep, that's true. And then um, I also provided what the percent positivity is for, for Springfield, West Springfield and Longmeadow. So there, our last week's percent positivity was 3.16%, which was a little bit higher than the previous week. So. Um, October 21st, our percent positivity was 2.86%. Um, and Springfield from October 28th was 2.7%. West Springfield was 2.93%. And Longmeadow was 1.78%. And if anyone's wondering, because I've gotten some questions about how percent positivity is calculated, um, and so I think it might be really good to mention that, but the, in general, that's the percentage of all tests that are um, reported as positive. Um, and so people get tested for lots of reasons, right? Um, there's still some surveillance testing going on where folks have to be tested on a periodic basis. For example, some of our local colleges and universities are still testing a lot of their students um, on a regular basis. A lot of folks are getting tested if, only if they have symptoms. Um, we know that the schools in some of those communities are doing testing, um, either pool testing or test and stay. Um, and so I, I just heard a lot of questions um, and I've seen some on some of our social media from the community. So I just thought it'd be really important to mention like what that percent positivity means. It doesn't mean that three point whatever percent of the residents of the community are testing positive. It means that of all the people getting tested, um, that's what the percentage is that are actually testing positive. And so people test and don't test for lots of reasons. And that's yeah. a rolling also over a 14 day period. So it's really important to recognize that's why those numbers sometimes don't shift that much, even mm -hmm. though the numbers go up or down. Um, and that also it doesn't represent if someone's doing a home test, which are readily available at many, you know, stores now so those are not reportable positivities as well um so that doesn't include a large population of people who are possibly testing at home who are negative or positive right yep and they just approved the bionex now antigen as as an approved test with the pcr so that um you know allows for an additional test other than the pcr test now that are reported to maven 
a lot of places have been reporting their antigens to Maven. You're supposed to um, under DP under DPH guidance. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Alex, thank you for providing all this data. This is a ton of data um, that I know I've been looking at periodically. Um, or if Katie or Rebecca have any questions or comments on any of this, um, I was actually struck by our more recent um, vaccination rates, those are up a lot since I think our last meeting, uh, particularly in those younger age groups. Um, we, the I, only I was thing really I was concerned about, oh, go no, I was surprised by the, by the fact that, you know, in the 70% of the 12 to 19 year olds had at least one dose. Um, that's up a lot since in the last couple of months. Um, so that the was, only concern I had was I know that they, if you look at the numbers from last month to this month, there's a bunch of people who got their first dose who didn't get their second dose in that age group. So I'd really encourage people, um, if your child got the first dose to make sure they are getting the second dose so they can have that full immune response and have the protection. Um, Cause the number, if you look at those who are fully vaccinated in that age group, that didn't go up that much. That was, and although it's great that we have seen a big improvement in those who are getting vaccines, um, we just want to make sure they get the whole series to keep them protected. Yeah. And even though the boosters are now approved, um, they have not changed the definition of what fully vaccinated means. So it's still, you know, the J and J one dose or the two doses of the Moderna and the Pfizer. Yep, and we're going to start to see a new line on this on this chart pretty soon. Yeah, our <laughs> um, under or under twelves. Did you guys have any other questions about the cases at all? Kind of moved on to the vac vaccinations, but do you have any narrative? I mean, I don't know if you can get any of that. Like, are you seeing still in the community? Like, are you seeing mostly household clusters? Yeah, you know, like I was saying, it's mostly household clusters. Um, what I'm really seeing now in comparison to last year with, with the alpha variant is that with the, with the Delta right now, it's you're seeing whole household testing positive. So regardless of full isolation, um, you're really seeing every single person in the household testing positive. So a lot, a lot of, um, not a lot of in-school transmission, but, um, you know, it's a lot of younger kids testing positive, bringing it home, um, and then parents testing positive. And that's what we're seeing in the hospital too, um, in terms of base states numbers. So we currently have six in the ICU and 35 hospitalized, and that's been flat for really the last few weeks. This last wave, it's really been downtrending much slower than the other waves have been because of the high rate of transmissibility amongst family members. Um, and the breakthrough cases this week for the state were 3192. Um, so that's just in the last week, but thankfully most of those cases have been very, very mild um, and very few have required hospitalization or ICU admission. Yeah. Yeah, and um, when I was looking at our cases from August 1st through October 31st, and 37% of them were breakthrough cases of fully vaccinated people. Um, but thankfully now they approved that the booster for, you know, um, anyone 18 and older that falls under those categories of either immunocompromised, living in, um, any type of assisted living or if you, depending on your job. So if you're at a high risk job, like being a teacher, you qualify for a booster shot and you can uh, search for the booster shots on the Vax Finder. You can, you can search specifically for um, boosters. There's a couple of different locations in town. So it's the CVS um, in East Long Meadow offers Moderna, the Walgreens offers Moderna and Pfizer. So. we're seeing the same thing at the higher ed level um, is that it's actually mostly students leaving and going home and being exposed off campus um, where we're seeing very little if any transmission we have a population that's absurdly vaccinated um, 
you know, 97% plus and seeing almost no transmission whatsoever. And the good thing we are seeing with those who are fully vaccinated when they are having breakthrough infections, if they do require hospitalization, it's they're in the hospital for a very short period of time and their symptoms resolve very relatively shortly compared to the unvaccinated. Um, you know, and unfortunately, those who are unvaccinated are still getting very, very ill, um, which is something, you know, unfortunately, we're having people still pass away from COVID, which is a reality we're still facing. Yeah. Rebecca, do you have any questions or anything you want to add? I'm just, I'm kind of soaking it in <laughs> and, um, you know, taking it in, listening, getting, you know, an idea, listening to the numbers. Um, I work in Springfield. I work in a high school. Um, it's quite large. It's probably close to 1,500 students. Um, and being in the shop, just a little background, uh, the students eat breakfast up there. They eat lunch up there. They're up there from 7.20 to 1.35. And we have, I teach juniors and seniors. We're the largest shop. I have 44 students up there and there's three of us. And then about 40 seniors. Um, we're getting calls if we do get, you know, notified of anybody being positive. They are doing some pool testing, the nurses. Um, it's been relatively low, you know. Um, nothing significant. Maybe we get a call one or two testing positive. Um, you know, as soon as any students have any symptoms, we send them down, they see the nurse, um, but not hearing anything extreme. So again, I'm just kind of listening, taking it in, trying to <laughs> kind of get my footing, um, you know, and uh, just, you know, reviewing the numbers and everything. And you know, kind of just being a student right now. And <laughs> um, Alex, I, I wasn't sure if you have this data. I was trying to calculate it myself, but I, I couldn't do it quick enough. Do we have the rate of increase of our vaccination rates over the last three months as well, too? I know that was one of the things that um, some of my colleagues in other towns had looked at to see, just to see like where we were, you know, in August versus where we are now. Um, I don't have that off the top of my head, but that's okay. That's okay. Don't <laughs> worry. Just because I'm obviously just thinking about as our cases are coming down, I'm hoping that our vaccination rates are still going up as well, too. Yeah, they're going up a little bit. Um, we did have like a big plateau in June, but okay. um, they have increased a little bit. And then, like I said, with the, the five to 11 year olds being able to be vaccinated and then once, I, I don't know, um, obviously with DESE, we don't, there's nothing the Board of Health ha can do about their mask mandate. Um, but hopefully once January 15th comes around, there'll be a big push to get to everybody to those 80% in order to remove the masks there. Um, Did we have a vaccine clinic at the school when it came out for the 12 and up? We did, yep. Um, the school nurses did a vaccination clinic. Um, we did it in at the end of the school year, so May and June. And I think it's important to sort of note what Alex was just talking about with the DESI guidelines for everybody watching. So DESI, which is the depart, I'm going to say this incorrectly, the Department of Elementary, Elementary and Secondary <laughs> Education. Thank you. Sorry, that's okay. Um, I know like all the brain. higher ed lingo, um, but we all just call it DESI. So DESI um, ha has basically has authority to um, over elementary and secondary education um, in Massachusetts. And so DESI has extended um, the mask mandate for um, schools in, across the Commonwealth, um, K through 12, I believe. Um, and that um, up until the point, and I think it's the individual district or the individual school has to actually petition DESE um, to remove the mask mandate. And that's if 80% of the occupants of the building, um, so that's students, employees, the calculating the denominator is really hard, um, <laughs> really, really hard. Um, but if 80% of the folks in that building um, 
are fully vaccinated um, before that January 15th, um, they can petition DESE to remove the mask mandate. I believe the only school system nearby that has actually calculated their numbers to, to exceed that 80% is Longmeadow High School right now. Um, and we'd be looking primarily at high school students, just given the fact that um, the other schools right now have five through 11 year olds in them who until literally tomorrow can't get vaccinated. Yeah, and um, like you said, it does include the staff. So um, Gordon did say that they have voluntarily asked their staff to show proof of vaccination, but they haven't required. So we really don't know the numbers for the staff part of the schools. We do obviously have the numbers for students, but not, not the staff and includes both staff and students. So um, that'll be up to the schools to request that information when January 15th, which will be here before we know it, but. Okay, is there any more questions on vaccination or anything any of you guys want to talk about for the vaccination? Is there, I don't know if this would have to be on a new business for next meeting, but talking about setting up another vaccine clinic for when the five to 11 year olds are approved, would that be something that we should offer to the community? I know many pediatricians are not going to have it. Um, so the idea if we had a centralized location so people don't have to worry about where their children can get access to it. I know some of the private um, like pharmacies are going to offer it, but I don't believe um, ours is going to be one of them in East Longmeadow. So I just wanted to bring up the idea of potentially, potentially planning something like that. Yeah, and uh, the other thing too is that a lot of pharmacies are nine, nine and up too. So that's important to know. I know big why, like when with our flu vaccines, they can only vaccinate and older. Um, there was a push to allow them to vaccinate I think as young as three years and older, or if not five years and older, um, now that they have approved the five to 11 year olds, because they're really the ones that carry the vaccines. Um, but I, I know our fire department is not super interested in doing another vaccination clinic. I don't know if our school nurses would be willing to do that. Um, our new director is starting November 15th, so that's pretty soon. So it would have to be a conversation with her if that's something that she was interested in doing. I will happily staff it. If we need <laughs> to have someone give vaccines, I will do it. Yeah, um, like like I said, with the pharmacies not, I would have, you know, we'd find out which pharmacies are gonna be able to give those vaccines. So if there's a couple places in town, you know, we'll feel better, but if there's not anywhere in town, then you know, that would definitely be something that, you know, would be beneficial for our schools and our, you know, anyone in that five to 11 year old group. And even for those who are older than 11 now, who, you know, maybe their parents have decided now that they feel a little more comfortable, they'd like to get them vaccinated. I mean, anyone can get vaccinated anytime. That's the great part about this. Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of access right now for 11 and up, um, but, I think, I, I appreciate their thought there, um, Katie, because I think it's really important. Um, and we know that a lot of parents are more willing to get their kids vaccinated from someone they trust. And so if that is a school nurse, um, and, you know, versus the, the pharmacy, I think that would um, benefit our community a lot. And so Alex, I do think that is something we should continue discussing, um, especially once we see over the next few weeks, the rollout of the, of the pediatric vaccine. And if it is easy to access in our community or if it's something where, you know, you're really gonna have to hunt down an appointment. Yeah, yeah, or wait for a pop-up clinic or something like that. Um, school, just being a school nurse for nine years before I taught upstairs um, and being in Springfield, we're looked at as kind of a catch-all, um, particularly at working in urban, um, you know, you're looking at socioeconomic, it's a huge, and I know, you know, just kind of getting off of East Long Meadow for a moment, but I know families and parents look at their school nurses um, for that education. And we have done, I know SciTech, which is school, a high school right next to us, has done some flu, um, not flu, rather, COVID clinics uh, vaccination. So um, 
yeah, it's a good idea. It makes sense. They're working closely with the students and they see them. And I think there's a trust there as well. All right, so if there's nothing else about vaccines, then we can move on to our mask mandate. So as all of you guys know, um, Springfield ended their mask mandate yesterday and Long Meadow voted last Tuesday to end their mask mandate. And West Springfield ended theirs a couple weeks ago now at the request of their mayor. I wanna start by thanking all the members of the community, those who joined us tonight, those who joined us back in August. I know there were several folks on that call as well. Um, the folks who have emailed, have reached out um, and, and all, all sides of the issue um, because I've heard from a lot of our community members, um, those who are interested in ending the mask mandate, those who are in support of it, um, particularly back in August, or from businesses back in August, um, appreciating that, you know, we were doing this so they didn't have to. Um, and I think no matter what we decide, it's really important to know that um, local organizations, local businesses can always continue to do what they, what they want to do. Um, if we choose to end the mask mandate, that local businesses still have the right to ask their own clients to wear a mask. Um, and that, as we already discussed, um, anything we would do would not change um, K through 12 education requirements. It would not change busing um, because that's under an entirely different guidance. And it would not change any of our healthcare settings um, because that's all under different guidance. So I just wanna put that out there um, to thank all of our community members, but to also address some of those issues that we know we can't change even if, you know, even if folks wanted to. Um, and you're still gonna have to wear one when you go to the doctor's office. And also to recognize, although the other cities lifted their mask mandates, they're not gone. They're advisories and they are still recommending if you are not vaccinated, that you wear a mask. And although I appreciate there's a lot of evidence that was brought up, there is more evidence that is more recent that actually does show that masking does protect against the particleization of COVID-19 and presents the spread of the flu. And that's another season we're about to enter into and so please be considerate of that fact as well, that the data, although you presented, was not accurate um, and that there is evidence that does show that, that literally just came out last month that masking with a surgical mask does prevent the spread of COVID-19. And if you are unvaccinated, especially with the Delta variant, the likelihood that you could spread it if you are in that infective contagious portion, which you don't even realize yet, it is highly, highly contagious and you don't have to be around someone that long to get it. Just to consider that. So. I really want to recommend that, you know, if you are considering going out when you don't feel well, you do wear a mask. Um, and the idea that the other towns have made it an advisory mm -hmm. is a big thing to recognize that it's not that it's gone completely and that they are advising those other factors like I mentioned previously. The other thing about the mask mandate is I do want to recognize that all our, though our numbers are dramatically better than they were previously, they did go up the last reporting that we did have for the positivity rate. Um, and that I do think we need to make sure that this is something that we, if we do decide to lift the mandate, if our numbers, you know, now that weather is getting cold and people are going to be inside and exposed more. Um, and if our rates do go back up, that a mass mandate again could come up in the future and that this is not a static thing that it will be gone forever if we do lift it as well. I think it's and also so important. I was gonna say, it's also important to recognize, um, I've heard, you know, recognizing what um, attorney McCarthy said with the businesses, um, having said that, I'll make sure that gets over to you, Alex. Um, but, you know, I, I also don't want to put our business community in a position um, where we're competing um, against other communities, particularly those directly around us. Um, what we don't talk always about is our neighbor to the south, which is Enfield, which hasn't actually had a mass mandate. Um, Connecticut's a different planet right now, it feels like. Um, but 
Um, also, for any businesses that primarily cater to uh, folks who are unvaccinated, so anybody who's catering their primary clientele is children, um, to really think about, you know, considering an advisory um, that you may want, if we choose to lift the mask mandate, that that would be a place where a private business um, really may want to think about maintaining one themselves. And that's also one of the things that all the community mass advisories are is that if you're in a place where there's children or if you are in a restaurant where there's a high traffic of volume or even grocery stores, um, just the large amount of people who come through um, to consider, obviously, when you're in those places to still wear a mask as well. I just want to address one more thing that was made in the public comment about the lack of oxygen and what that can do to your brain. And he showed a bus driver in a, in a mask. There is no evidence to support that your oxygen saturation goes down when you wear a mask. I have worn a mask for 20 years in my career and have operated on people. My oxygen level does not drop. And they've actually studied this extensively as well. So there is no concern that our bus drivers are not safe when they are masking. Yeah. And um, if you guys want to make our mask mandate an advisory, we can write up something similar to what Long Meadow did and post that as well. Um, they didn't have any formal advisory. They just wrote something up and then posted that um, the following day. So um, we can definitely write something up and send it over to you guys and for you to, to approve that. And Mary has her hand raised in the chat. I just noticed that. Thanks, uh, Katie. I appreciate it. I didn't see it. Thank you. You let me back in. Um, All right. Just a procedural matter, Alex, I wanted to remind you that any votes taken have to be by roll call um, because of the remote uh, Zoom factor here. And I think uh, once the board makes a decision um, uh, procedurally, I think there needs to be a motion uh, with respect to the mask mandate. So just wanted to make those two comments and can't help it. It's the lawyer in me butting in all the time, sorry. I have a question about procedure. If we do want to make an advisory, do we then vote to remove the mandate and then vote to make an advisory? I don't, I guess I'm just trying to understand the procedure aspect of it. I think you would vote to rescind the mandate and then somebody would make a motion to create the advisory um, guidance or opinion or uh, regulation, whatever we're going to call that. But I, th I think there's two actions necessary there. Yeah, so Chris, so I had sent um, some sample motions to Christine. Um, so if you wanted to, you could say the second part of that first motion that I had sent to you. We can, so we do it in two different ones, Alex. Yeah. Okay, um, Rebecca, Katie, are we at the point where we're ready to make a motion? Do you have any other questions, any other concerns? Okay, um, so I'm gonna start with the first half then. Um, so I'm gonna make the motion to rescind the mask mandate um, in East Long Meadow for indoor public places. Um, is that adequate language right there, Alex? And Mary, did I? I think it's sufficient, yes. Okay. Then someone has to second it. I second. Okay, and then for the roll call, I just, um, Call each person out, Mary. Okay, yes. so Christine Johnson. Uh, I is that what I say? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're either voting. You're voting in favor of the motion. In, in favor of the motion, which would be in favor of rescinding the mandate. Yes. Correct? Yes. 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 So, um, Catherine Robbins. Aye. And then Rebecca Torsha. 
Aye. I'm in favor. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then I'm going to make a second motion. Um, and I'm going to motion that we do institute um, a mask advisory um, following the Mass Department of Health um, recommendations for all un unvaccinated individuals to continue to mask indoors um, and all vaccinated residents who are at increased risk from COVID-19. And also, is that accurate information right there? And the, do we add the line about the DESI and following the DESI guidelines for school systems on that advisory too, or does that have to be part of it? Or does that not even matter because I think DESI is a separate, yeah, I think DESI, okay. they are their own entity and they're dictating to the schools right now from what I understand. Okay, so let me and clarify be, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I guess the, the, um, the motion then would be to Im, um, implement a mask advisory um, to recommend that all unvaccinated individuals continue to mask indoors um, and to continue to follow all Massachusetts DPH guidelines regarding masking. Someone else to second it? I, um, I just want to clarify. So I just looked up on the Mass DPH. They are still advising all indoors to wear a mask. Um, and that's how it's written. Um, okay, so I don't want to use that language then because yeah, that would be conflicting yeah. information. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, no, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Okay, um, so going to make this shorter and easier then. Motion to um, implement a mask advisory um, recommending that all unvaccinated individuals continue to mask indoors and anyone at high risk um, of COVID-19. I second that. Okay, so um, Christine Johnson. Aye. Catherine Jobbins. Aye. And Rebecca Torsha. Aye. Okay. Can I just say something too, is that I wanna make sure that people feel comfortable um, that even though the mask mandate now um, that we just voted to remove it, is that people who want to mask still feel comfortable doing so. Um, that if, if you are unvaccinated for any reason, if you're at high risk, or if that is just something for your own comfort, um, for those that live in your household, whether you live with children, whether you live with other folks who are um, at high risk of developing complications, or if it's just something that you wanna do for, um, that, that you are welcome to do so in our community and you're encouraged to do so. Um, and that just because the mandate has been lifted does not mean that you should be targeted in any way, shape or form. So um, does that, I just wanna put that out there that we as a community definitely wanna support each other um, for the overall health of our community. I just want to add to that because Chris, that was very eloquent. I appreciate you stating that. And that also to remember, if you are choosing to be unvaccinated, that is 100% your decision. But also remember that we are in a community and we ask you to please follow this. We are not, there's, there's no way for us to keep track of this, but that we ask you to remember that there are people in our community who cannot protect themselves. So try to protect them if you are choosing to not be vaccinated. Is there anything else anybody wants to add? Um, I'm just really grateful for our community members, um, for everybody who's joined us tonight. Um, and I would encourage you, what did I just grab my pen? That was that loud noise. Um, I would really encourage you to participate in um, our meetings moving forward. It's not it's just gonna be COVID for the rest of time. We have a lot of work. Um, the Board of Health, right, along with our health department, um, on just the health of our community. There's a lot of other issues affecting the health of our community. And so for all the folks who joined us, the folks who were watching in our business community um, that made their voices heard, we really encourage you to continue to work with us long beyond COVID um, in all the ways that you can support the health of the community. All right, so um, Christine, or I'm 
Someone has to make a motion to close the meeting. Can we schedule another meeting before we close this meeting? Yeah. So we do have to meet one more time um, the week of November 5th, mm -hmm. which is the week that Tammy is starting. So. Sorry, you, you broke up. What week is that? The week of November 15th, we have to meet in an executive session. I'm on service at the COVID floor at the hospital that week. <laughs> um, so if we could do it at like 6.30 in the evenings, that would be easier for me, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah we usually meet at um, 6, 6.30. It's that's actually okay. a great time. I appreciate that. Evening is nice and after everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm with y'all. Yeah, <laughs> 630. That's fine with me. Um, Katie, so, Rebecca, are there any nights that don't work for you in particular? Um, um, Rebecca, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm uh, in grad school right now. Um, so okay. Wednesdays up until, oh God, it's like a never ending. I'm like <laughs> the oldest person in the world going back, but two, two more classes and then I'll have my master's. So um, I finished December 15th, but I do one every Wednesday, that Wednesday at Westfield state in person. So if we could just, you know, any other day, um, Tuesday, Tuesdays, Tuesdays tend to work fine Thursday. So Jesse Belcher, Timmy has to attend. So from the AG's office for that executive session. So he said that he's available the 15th the 17th and the 18th. So I can do the fifth, the 15th is the Monday and that won't interfere with Rebecca. No, nope, well I'm too. good. I'm good with that too. That'd be great. Yeah. Sure. That'll work. I was going to say it's not you? great for me. Um, oh. The 18th would be better, which is the Thursday, but um, I can, I can make it work if I have to. I could do from six to seven on the 18th, but I can't go past seven because I have another meeting. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm okay, no, ladies, with either either day and that six o'clock works well for me. I can do six. Is that six. enough to come, Alex? Yeah, I think that an hour okay. for that meeting and um, hopefully our new director will be able to attend too because she's starting the 15th. So um, oh, great. So we're then no November 18th. And Alex, Alex, you'll send us a calendar invite and all that stuff. Yep. Yep, I'll send you a calendar invoice for that. Um, so it's the 18th. So I'll let Jesse know. And um, I'll send you guys more information on the on that executive session as well. Um, okay. Alex, if I could just say one more thing, or Christine, I I just want to um, thank you. I think you're going to be a great board working together. And Chris, I thank you so much for your comments directed to the community. The issues that face this board presently are very difficult ones. And I'm very impressed by your collective, thoughtful, sensitive consideration of all of the arguments. So moving forward, I think um, we'll have great success. And uh, once again, I just want to thank you for your willingness to participate for the betterment of East Long Meadow in general. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. Normally we wouldn't have two meetings in one month, but um, we do have to have, like I said, we don't have this meeting. So I'll send you guys all the information about it. And um, like I said, hopefully our new director can attend so she can meet all of you guys. Sounds good. Yeah. Great. Anything else? Uh, motion to adjourn. Yeah, I was going to do that next. I <laughs> just wanted to make sure everyone had uh, everything answered. Um, so with that, uh, we'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'm second. Okay, so um, Christine Johnson. Approved. Aye. Aye. Katie Jobin. Aye. <laughs> Rebecca Torsha. Hi. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, you, Alex. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye now. All right, Mary. Bye. 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 Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>